Hello, I'm Bob Challoner, the President and CEO of Southampton Hospital, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Focus on Southampton Hospital, your monthly program about the events, happenings, and people at your local community hospital. Today I have a very special guest with me who's been on the program before, Dr. Rajiv Fernando, a beloved member of our medical staff, who's also our Director of Infectious Diseases. And today we're going to be talking about a topic very big in the news these days and of concern to many people, the Zika virus. Um, and before I do that, I'd like to just welcome you, Dr. Fernando. Thank oh. you for being with us today. Thank you for having me on the show, Mr. Challenger. And also, as we've just done in the past, just could you tell me a little bit about yourself and your training? People are always interested to know about the various medical specialties, sure. and you're a director, uh, doctor of infectious diseases. Sure, so. absolutely. Um, I initially grew up in the Bronx, uh, subsequently moved to India for high school and medical education over there. Uh, subsequently returned to the States, uh, did my medical residency at Brooklyn Hospital uh, and fellowship at Dartmouth. Great. And so how did you become interested in infectious diseases? Um, the, uh, I grew up with, uh, I grew up working in countries with impoverished conditions uh, where infectious disease is the number one cause of mortality and hence the choice was very simple for me. And you've been um, here at Southampton now for five years? This is my fifth, fifth year. year. Great. Yeah. Well, we're very, I know you're the only infectious disease uh, doctor out here in the East End, so we're very, very pleased to have yeah. you with us. Yeah. You know, as soon as I finished fellowship, uh, Southampton Hospital provided a brilliant opportunity for me uh, where they were looking for a young infectious disease uh, physician to start the program at a grassroots level, and I am very happy to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you, and you've done uh, great work already in a number of areas around the hospital and keeping. Uh, uh, keeping us not only taking care of patients that have infectious diseases, but helping guide us in the monitoring and control of infection, which is always a big issue in, uh, in, in healthcare organizations. Very happy to be here. Great. And so today we're going to talk about the Zika virus, Zika virus, which is in the news this year. And um, with summer approaching, I've heard I've heard a lot of people talk already about you know is Zika something we need to worry about. And I thought we'd just start off, um, before we get into the specifics of the diseases, but just a little bit about precaution about um, Zika and things people may, may do initially just to, to safeguard themselves. Sure. Um, so the Zika virus, uh, for starters, uh, the two vectors that spread Zika virus are a mosquito called Aedes aegypti and a cousin called Aedes albopictus. Now it's important to know that uh, Long Island we do have both the vectors here. We, we do have, we do have okay. both the vectors, so it's really important uh, to know about how to prevent this disease. Uh, the first thing I'd like to mention is uh, clothing. That's really important. Uh, when you're outside, try to wear long sleeve uh, shirts, wear pants as well. There's a compound called permethrin, and permethrin is, uh, can be applied to clothing, okay. and that sort of acts like a repellent to keep the mosquitoes away. Uh, it shouldn't be applied to skin, but applying it to clothing is useful. useful. Uh, it, interestingly, uh, when you apply it once to clothing, turns out you could keep, uh, you can throw it in the washing machine multiple times, but the permethrin actually stays on the clothing. Will stay. Where do you, where do you get permethrin? It can be avoided. Uh, you right. can, it can be obtained um, in medical stores over here, and there are certain compounds uh, which are EPA licensed, so that's important to know as well. Uh, some of the EPA licensed uh, products, the biggest compound that I find useful is something called DEET. Okay. That is the biggest compound. There's some literature about eucalyptus oil as well, but I feel DEET is the most reliable. DEET is in a lot of the, yes. the uh, insecticides that that's, see that's accurate. Or yes. the repellents, I yes. should say. Yes, that's accurate. Uh, important, uh, Bob, that um, it's important to know that it has to be EPA licensed. There are a lot of companies out there uh, producing uh, repellents which don't have the active compounds. It's critical to know the EPA licensed products. Some of the other things... Uh, Is you that can EPA licensing something you would see on the, yes. on the labeling? Look okay. for the... Uh, you can do that and also look for the compounds as well. Okay. And that's important to know. Some of the other things you can use to prevent disease are really with this hot summer, 
Uh, it's important to try and stay indoors with air conditioning. Okay. Now, mosquitoes thrive in the warm weather, so we will. Uh, I do expect um, a surge of these mosquitoes to be out there. So try and stay indoors with air conditioning. That's very important. The other thing I would consider is mosquitoes love to breed in these small puddles of water. Okay. And uh, a, even a Coca-Cola cap uh, can contain as many as 200 eggs from the mosquitoes. So 200 any eggs? Yeah, Coca-Cola. yeah, 200 wow. eggs. So it's important anytime you see a puddle of water that you uh, to be cognizant of the fact that mosquitoes can be hanging out in this area. Uh, some of the other things you can do if you have a large pool of water and you find it difficult to actually do this on your own, there are phone numbers available on the internet, and if you call them, it's, uh, with, it, you get in touch with the state, and these people will actually come home and clean this, uh, this pool or puddle of water out. Okay, great. Well, and certainly it's tough to stay indoors all summer, I, because, I mean, as today, we're out here on this beautiful day. We chose the opportunity to film yes, outdoors. And yes. As everyone can tell from the lawn mowing in the background, it's yeah. always a, we are definitely outdoors, but... Um, I thought the lawnmower was strategically uh, made for this program, just to you know, just to. I think it enhance. was just to challenge our discussion I, I think so. a little bit. I, I think so. So let's talk a little bit about Zika now. Um, uh, just I've just heard of it. I mean, what is what's the history of this virus? Yeah, so. um, the Zika virus was isolated uh, from the Zika forest in Uganda. Uh, it's a place to- yeah, Zika is the forest where it was isolated from in 1947, and that's where the name comes from. We had one case, uh, the first case was in 1952, was from a rhesus monkey. Subsequently, we haven't really heard much about uh, Zika virus until 2007, where we had infections uh, in Micronesia. It's interesting, I, I feel the, the reason we didn't hear of these infections is the, the virus mutated over a period of time to enhance its pathogenicity, and that's when we first saw it in 2007. So it has been around, it just hasn't been too bad of a virus Absolutely, before. we've seen it in Africa, it's been in Asia, but this is the first time it's really crossing over to the Western Hemisphere. Okay, any theories on how it came over, or is it just? I, one theory which I, uh, one of my hypotheses is, uh, in 2014, we had uh, cases in Polynesia, um, and uh, subsequently, this was 2014, subsequently later in the year, Brazil was uh, hosting a canoe competition. Okay. And my guess uh, is people who actually had the virus multiplying in their blood from Polynesia, when they came over to Brazil for this canoe competition, uh, the mosquitoes bit the, the people from French Polynesia. And at that time, they had the virus multiplying in, in the blood. And I think that's where it all took off. That's how it started. Wow. So, so it started to appear on our radar when, 2000? It's a great question. Yeah. And uh, as infectious disease doctors, we really, uh, we follow outbreaks across the planet and we always follow to see what is their propensity to actually cause pandemics. Uh, we started following the Zika virus in uh, 2015 where we were starting to see cases of microcephaly, simply put a small head that was associated with this uh, virus. It wasn't proven, scientifically proven until later on, but that's the working hypothesis we had in 2015. 2015, okay. So, and just let's talk a little bit. You said there's two types of mosquitoes? That's and, correct. And how, how is it spread? Uh, mosquito uh, transmission is the predominant okay. way. Like I mentioned, uh, it's the Aedes aegypti, and there's, its cousin is called Aedes albopictus. We still haven't uh, established absolute transmission through this uh, vector, but it certainly it certainly can. That's that's those are our thoughts initially. Uh, the top cause, of course, is mosquito transmission. You can have mother to child transmission, uh, sexual uh, through vaginal, anal, or oral sex, uh, through blood transfusions, and of course through organ transplantation as well. Okay, and I want to talk about that in a little bit. But just um, how does a how does a physician diagnose somebody with uh, Zika? So I'm bitten by a mosquito. What what happens next? How am I diagnosed? So the first thing the physician should have in mind is uh, tr- returning travelers. Zika has been identified in 58 countries, and uh, if someone comes back with symptoms and they're coming from any one of these 58 countries where there's active transmission, uh, I believe the physician should have that uh, thought process going 
and set out appropriate testing. Now we have brilliant physicians in our practice, meeting counseling practice, and uh, they've diagnosed Zika over here because they are aware of the clinical index of suspicion, returning travelers, and they've diagnosed Zika virus right here in so Southampton. We, we, we've seen it already in Absolutely, this area. absolutely. Okay. And um, are there any tests that can definitively identify uh, someone yes. who has Zika virus? Yes, uh, in the initial phases, uh, Zika virus is found in the blood. Uh, you can uh, isolate it from the blood. You do what's called a PCR, which detects the virus uh, uh, directly. Uh, it's seen in the blood initially. Subsequently, you can see the virus in the urine. But as time goes by, you develop the body develops an antibody response to the virus, and that's what you're going to see later on. Okay. So, um, and is the test fairly definitive? I know with some diseases, it's the test isn't 100 percent. Is this test yes. pretty definitive? Uh, so, with the virus, if you're finding the virus in the blood or urine, right. it's definitive. Now, the antibody levels are challenging because. Uh, Zika virus belongs to a family of mosquito-borne diseases like dengue or chikungunya, which can cause a cross-reactivity, which can cause a false positive Zika. So that's important. There are some various confirmatory tests we can perform as well, but it's important to understand that they could be false positives with the antibody level. What, um, what symptoms, uh, somebody that's been contracted the virus, what are the symptoms you look for? Yes. Uh, the first thing, like I mentioned, is a returning traveler. That's what I really think of. Uh, only 20%, 15 to 20% of patients uh, really have symptoms if they're contracted the Zika virus. Some of the symptoms to look for are a low-grade fever, uh, joint pain, diffuse joint pain. They tend to have red eyes and a low-grade fever. Okay. Those are some of the things red I look for. Red eyes and a low-grade fever. Yeah, pain. yeah. Um, so it's possible that some people can have the virus without, without any symptoms? Uh, Absolutely. Not feel sick at all? Absolutely. The vast proportion of people, uh, ranging between 80 to 85 percent of people, will not have symptoms at all. Wow. And we hear, it seems like with increasing frequency, about bug-borne diseases. And uh, certainly on the East End, we're, yes. we're familiar with Lyme and tick-borne diseases. Some of the symptoms that uh, it always seems to be the same symptoms: fever, joint yeah. pain, those yeah. kind of things. Is it possible that somebody who thinks they've got a tick-borne disease may have Zika and vice versa? That's a, that's a great question, Mr. Challoner. And uh, they can certain symptoms can actually present in the same way. But I'm going to do my best to kind of uh, separate the symptoms. Okay. Uh, both of them can have fevers. Both of them will have rashes. Now, the rash that you see in a Zika virus is a diffuse picture, which is like all over the body. In Lyme disease, you tend to have what's called a bullseye lesion, which is localized to a single area. Uh, Lyme disease people can also have uh, fevers. We mentioned that. They can both have joint pain as well. But the biggest way to differentiate is really the, the travel. Someone coming from a, a returning traveler is where you really think about to which will point you in which direction, whether it's Lyme or Zika virus. So what are um, the main stumbling blocks that we're seeing in terms of uh, dealing with this, with this virus right now? And it's, it's, uh, it really seems like it's spreading rapidly. Is that true or is that just my perception? It, it is spreading rapidly. We assume um, in Brazil there are going to be 1.5 million cases in Brazil. Uh, Puerto Rico, I expect cases to go upwards of 80,000 cases in Puerto Rico. Some of the things that I feel are limiting, uh, limiting our uh, response to Zika virus is really funding. Okay. Uh, we're looking for Congress to fund more money uh, for developing vaccines, also more protection for people around the country and most importantly in our area as well in Suffolk County. So we need more money to uh, be put into fighting off Zika virus question that I, as we were talking about fever, and I've heard this said about Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases, somebody in the middle of the summer develops um, flu-like symptoms. Is it your opinion that maybe they have contracted something from a, from a, from a tick or that's a, that's a great question. Um, you do think of tick-borne disease as well. Once again, the, uh, the history is critical over right. here. So someone who's in the garden uh, a long time, someone's in the grass a long time, you think of Lyme disease. Some of the other things that you see are your run-of-the-mill viral infections as well. So someone who gives you a history of uh, sick contact and both of them sharing the same symptoms, I would think of a viral infection. Or someone who's in the grass for a long time, gardening, 
those are the things I would think of uh, with Lyme disease. So once again, the history is critical. Rather than going about ordering unnecessary tests, I mean, the history is critical. And um, certainly lots of mosquitoes in our area in the summer. Um, have there been cases yet on Long Island of people actually contracting directly from a mosquito? I understand travelers, people have traveled, but have anybody you know, contracted the virus yet on, on, as a result of a mosquito bite on Long Island? Absolutely zero okay. in Long Island and absolutely zero in the entire United States. Okay, so not even in Florida or those areas no. at this point. Okay, but something they're watching for. Uh, my gut feeling is we'll have clusters of cases uh, reported around the United States. I highly doubt this will reach uh, epidemic or pandemic proportions. Okay. So the tragic thing with Zika, it seems like it's a particular issue with you know pregnant moms and newborn babies. It's, you describe microcephaly. Yes. Can you just describe that? What is what is microcephaly and, uh, and uh, what's the connection with the uh, with this virus? Yes. Uh, quite simply put, uh, microcephaly is a small head. And uh, like I had mentioned, uh, there, in 2015, they were postulating the link between these brain defects and Zika. But a few months ago, it was proven by scientists that there is definitely a link between the virus and this condition. It's also important to have in the background, what, they, what are the other causes of microcephaly besides uh, people jumping to the conclusion that it's Zika virus. Some of the other things I've noticed are uh, when there's a, a process called fetal hypoxia, which means there's not enough oxygen that's going to the brain, um, which also causes a small head. This can happen during the pregnancy or in utero or during delivery of the baby. You can have decreased blood flow to the brain. That can cause microcephaly as well. Certain genetic defects like uh, Down syndrome that can cause microcephaly, a bunch of infections uh, called CMV or toxoplasma, or people who have not, uh, uh, rubella virus is another thing that can cause it. Uh, in addition to that, uh, some of the other things you see which can cause a microcephaly is malnutrition. That's one of the things. And lastly, I'd like to point out uh, certain toxic chemicals like alcohol, drugs, uh, or other substances, these can cause microcephaly as well. So it's very important for the clinician to think of a broad differential diagnosis, not just label it as Zika virus when they come in. And is there a, um, what are the long-term, what are the impacts certainly for the child? It seems pretty devastating, and what's the long-term prognosis for a baby born with microcephaly? The long-term prognosis is poor, unfortunately. I, at this point, what I really like to do is have a multidisciplinary approach between the pediatrician and the neurologist, and that's the only thing we can do to, uh, to kind of prevent the, uh, the sequence, the rapidity of sequence of events, but I, I always believe in a multidisciplinary approach. And are there other, um, other uh, birth defects or uh, malformations associated with Zika other than microencephaly? Yes, there are multiple right. conditions that can be associated. I think at this point we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. There are many more that are in evolution. Uh, brain imaging is very helpful. Right. It can cause other, um, other uh, defects as well. But I think it's very early in the disease and scientists and infectious disease doctors are still trying to understand the disease. What the long other yes. impacts of it. Yes. Um, so what would you recommend for pregnant women out here on Long Island um, uh, this summer and, um, you know, generally, I think, you know, uh, the first thing, uh, like I always want to say, is if you're pregnant, avoid travel to these 58 countries unless it's mandatory. Uh, Are those countries listed somewhere? Is there, yeah, it's yeah. listed. Uh, you okay. can definitely, uh, it's very simple. CDC website? Not the CDC. We focus more on the United States, but okay. where I'm always looking at, um, you know, where it's around the world. So that's right. important to know. Um, so looking at the CDC and other websites as well, different countries. In the Pacific, they have different websites where you can follow. Um, the other precautions are pretty, pretty much the same. I would uh, avoid, like I mentioned, which is concerning, that we do have the vectors right here in Long Island. It's the, uh, the same precautions, which is uh, wearing permethrin-treated clothes, long sleeves, shirts, and pants, uh, using insect repellent with compounds such as Z uh, DEET, and avoiding puddles of water and staying in air condition as much as you can. 
Some women might be concerned about wearing insect repellent or de um, permethrin on their clothing. Any, any issues or concerns about that? That's a brilliant question. And turns out there's no adverse effect uh, while, while using these comp compounds in pregnancy. Also, I'd like to point out where if you're in the process of using sunscreen, it's important to use the sunscreen first followed by uh, the compound. So sunscreen, then the, then the, then the insect repellent. That's, that's accurate. Um, you mentioned that Zika can also be transmitted sexually. It's not just from a mosquito bite. Yes. Um, and uh, is that that's true? And that's you know? true. Uh, it can be spread through vaginal transmission, uh, rectal transmission, and oral transmission. So somebody kissing potentially could. Uh, uh, that's yet to be this okay. uh, thing, but definitely oral sex okay. is something that we know of. Okay. The other thing which we is still unproven is the reverse method of vaginal sex, someone who is infected, uh, a woman who is infected and transmitting over to the guy, that's still not, um, that's still not um, identified yet, but we are keeping an eye out for that. If you've had um, Zika, um, are you immune? Is it, a, is it a virus that you develop an immunity to? So Zika has multiple strains. Okay. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, if you develop a Zika virus to a particular strain, the hypothesis of being what that follows the pattern of uh, infectious diseases, you will develop immunity to that particular strain. However, there are various different strains that are circulating. So if someone has had Zika virus in the past and they, have, they come in with a reinfection, the likely hypothesis is they've been uh, reinfected for an, from another strain rather than say there's a failure of antibodies. Okay, so you can't assume I've had it once, I'll never get it, never it's, get uh, it again. That's not accurate, yeah. Um, and you talked about with sexual transmission, I, I understand the need for women uh, who may be childbearing to be careful, so it sounds like men should be taking certain precautions also. What, what, what should men be doing? So uh, men from uh, these affected countries, when they come back, uh, the, uh, the guidelines are really to uh, use uh, condom pr uh, protection all the time. Or if you, um, oh, the other thing is if you don't want to use condoms uh, to abstain from sex for a period of uh, three weeks. Okay, after they've returned That's from correct. travel. And certainly, is, is it possible for a man, a woman may be pregnant, the husband has traveled, uh, has contracted it to transmit to the woman while she's pregnant, so they need to be very Absolutely, careful. absolutely. Um, what if I can't avoid traveling to the southern part of the United States or Puerto Rico, my business takes me there, or I've got family or something, what, um, what, what, what other precautions should I be thinking about? I think about I would follow, uh, the precautions are pretty universal. Okay. I would still the same treatment, treated clothing, avoid, um, to try to stay in air conditioning, puddles of water, uh, the same precautions I would take. Okay. So, uh, what a woman who may be pregnant has discovered she's contracted the um, the virus. What should she be doing? So. That's a great question. And turns out the virus in pregnant women tends to be longer, unlike the uh, the returning traveler, uh, which kind of, uh, like I said, the the virus multiplies in the blood for seven to three, uh, seven to 21 days. In pregnancy, it's been noted to, uh, to last longer, almost okay. through the duration of the pregnancy. Some of the things you can do is sample the uh, placental fluid to see whether it's multiplying over there. And that kind of zones you in into saying there might be a congenital deformity from Zika virus. Uh, it's also important to do fetal sonograms you can do. It's, um, Unfortunately, fetal sonograms may not be, it's not a great sensitive test, so we may miss cases over there. Uh, at this point, di uh, discussing a multidisciplinary approach with you know, the infectious disease doctor and the obstetrician is critical here. Okay, and you mentioned pediatricians also. So. Yes. What about uh, children? Are there any risks um, for children with the Zika virus? I mean, and, and women, other, other than uh, childbearing women, are there other, other risks or other people if they discovered other long-term uh, risks uh, associated with the virus? Uh, the, the, there's no additional risk in children right, right now, but I think that has to be watched. I mean, the, the cases that we've discussed so far are uh, pregnant women and um, what happens in adulthood. There's nothing special that we've seen so far, uh, a particular syndrome that can occur 
in the pediatric population, but that has to be, that's yet to be determined and we continue to follow this. It's, uh, it's a disease that's in evolution and we're trying to find, get more information and figure this out at this point. And another question um, which we hear about, it seems like vaccines are wonderful and um, what's, where are we in the terms of developing a vaccine for this virus? So the FDA recently approved uh, a vaccine which, which is in healthy volunteers. Uh, it's very early, uh, what we call the phase one trial, which is very early. And this is to determine uh, safety uh, and uh, the immunogenicity, which is how the body will build antibodies to fight this virus. It's very early, but we have one trial, it's going on, the FDA approved this trial. There are also multiple trials going across the planet. Some trials in Asia where we've had Zika virus for a longer time, that's going on as well. But in the United States, we have, uh, the FDA has recently approved a vaccine to go into trial. How long, do you have a guess? In terms how yeah, long it might take before we'll see an effective uh, my vaccine? gut feeling is we may have a slightly a premature um, licensure okay. just to because of the burden of illness we're having right, right now. But it's really hard to predict because we're in very early stages of the vaccine. And why? What is it about this virus? That's so I mean, it seems like we we develop a new flu vaccine every year. Why is it so? What's so difficult about this virus? So I. I my prediction is we'll have a good, successful vaccine. Okay. We've uh, developed uh, vaccines to the other viruses in the same fi family. We've okay. developed a dengue vaccine. We have a yellow fever vaccine. So these are the same family of viruses. And uh, I'm very confident we'll develop uh, a vaccine that can protect for Zika. It's just that uh, we're seeing it in the Western Hemisphere recently, and we've kind of been behind, and you know now we're being aggressive. You know, a question I'm curious about, um, it seems like it emerged because we're hearing about these cases of microencephaly in Brazil and um, yeah. in South America, and yet I do read and I've heard you say that this virus has been in Asia and Micronesia for, for years and possibly in Africa for decades. Um, is the microencephaly something new? Is it something new that's happening? Or is it just because it was so far away we didn't really hear about it? What, what's, what's going on? That's there? a great question once again. And uh, the th some of the hypothesis is it wasn't recognized earlier on. Uh, in the 60s or 70s, it's hard to say whether uh, the cause of microcephaly was actually caused by Zika. But now, since we have Brazil, we're able to initially we had a potential link and now we've definitely identified. So the two hypotheses over there, one would be that we just didn't identify that the Zika virus was a cause of microencephalitis. But the place where I would put my money on is the virus is actually mutated to enhance its pathogenicity to cause these kind of symptoms. Okay, so it, there's some, it's, it, your feeling is something has had changed with Changed the with the virus, okay. yeah, multiple mutations. And if we develop an immunization, um, you mentioned there's multiple strains. Does that mean we need multiple immunizations? We may have to look at that. Uh, and okay. I think for starters, what they will vaccinate is against the predominant strain. Okay. Uh, that's yet to be determined at this point. With very early studies like in Bench. Okay, great. I know we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to ask you if I'm sure people, especially uh, young parents, have a lot of concerns about this. Where would they go for additional information? We have wonderful testing uh, in our outpatient uh, facilities. Our meeting house practice uh, physicians are very well trained in this. And like I mentioned, we've diagnosed cases right here in Southampton. Uh, if someone has symptoms and they're returning from these countries, uh, we can, they can go to the, one of our practice uh, offices. I think also it's important to know that, you know, since we have so much information that's evolving on a day-to-day -day basis, I like the CDC website. CDC. Yeah, okay. where you can follow them. There's frequent updates on the best testing there is. So before I order the, uh, a, a test to diagnosis, a lot of times I would either look at the website or call them directly and say, explain the clinical situation and uh, what they would suggest with testing. 
Well, it sounds like something our medical staff is also uh, scrambling to keep up with as well, but I know working very hard and with your guidance and help doing very well. So thank you very much, Dr. Fernando, for all this great information. So Thank you for having me on this show. Wonderful having you on our medical wonderful. staff. Wonderful. And uh, next time we do, do a show, we'll plan our suits. Uh, we'll, we'll do something a little a little differently, or maybe we'll match up again. I like, we'll I like, like the, the, I like the matching. Exactly. Thanks for, I agree with you. I thanks agree. for having thank me on this show. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all of you for watching this program. Certainly this is an important topic. If anyone has any questions um, or concerns, you can call, um, call our office at 631-726-8555. We'll get you the information. Um, if you have ideas for additional health topics that you'd like to hear about that we can present, um, we would like to hear from you as well, or just need help navigating the health system here on the East End please feel free to give us a call. I'd like to thank our friends as always at CTV for the wonderful job that they do in producing this show and airing it in Southampton and our friends at LTV for airing the show in, um, in our East Hampton communities and the great service that they're providing. I hope you all have an enjoyable summer. Stay, health, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you.